Good afternoon. This year is Leila Nishmas, Elimelech ben Levi Yitzchak, Osher Shmuel Chaim ben Ephraim Mitzyona, Esther Basara, Osher ben Yosef, Rivka Yitzchak Isaac, Tzvi Dov ben Chaim Pesach, Yitzchak ben Sara, Devorah Bas Yitzchak, Avram ben Mordechai ben David, Reuven ben Shmuel, Chana Gold Bas Yisrael, Chaim ben Fager, Matalei Bas Elio, Chana Ita Bas Moshe David, Yeshua ben Shmuel, Mordechai Netzach ben Rivka. Shoshana bat Clara ben Yamin, Batya Esther bat ben Yamin, Ashraf Ilana bas Esther, Zalman Leib ben Moshe, Ani Chai ben Yaakov. Leila Nishmatam. This afternoon, why are we fasting? What is uh, a Sarabat Tevis all about? So if you look in the book of Yechezkel, Perik of Dalid, Yechezkel was uh, deported before the Khurban by Nebuchadnezzar. Yechezkel is the only... No, please turn off your cell phones. Thank you. What? Uh, Yehuda's giving out these sources, I hope. Uh, one, one paper. Thank you to a customer. So that. Um, we're not going to use the source sheets yet. We're not up to the source sheets yet. Please hold them. One paper with two sides. Thank you. But the reason we're fasting, Yechezkel was the only Navi that prophesied in Babylon, Long Island. You know that. I mean in Babylon. The only Nabi, there are 48 Nevi'im in Tanakh, Lillian, and the only Nabi that prophesied outside of Israel was Yechezkel. So he's already in Bavel, and God tells him in chapter 24, He b'chodesh asiri, Chodesh. Moshe, when is that? Today. Please turn off your cell phones. When is that? That's today, 10-10. Right, b'chodesh asiri b'osel achodesh as etzem ayom azeh in the middle of this day samach melech bavel al yerushalayim. You know, Avi. So today the siege begins. Yecheskel didn't know because he wasn't in Jerusalem anymore. He was years before deported to Bavel. So God tells him b'chodesh asiri b'osel achodesh, which is today samach melech bavel el yerushalayim. The siege begins. The blockade begins today. But no Jews were killed today. And yet, the Bes Yosef makes an amazing observation. He says that the only fast that can come out on Friday is what? Roseanne? The only fast that can come out on Friday is what? Sorbet Avis. You're fasting into Shabbos. Tanas Esther on Friday, but not here. Magdimim, no. Magdimim, you're right. Okay, Magdimim. But the only fast mentioned in Tanakh that can come out on Friday, the way our calendar is set up, is uh, a sorry, but it happened a couple of years ago, I remember. Next time is 2023. 2023. And you're fasting into Shabbos. You're singing, you're singing Shalom Aleichem, and you're still fasting. And the Bez Yosef makes an amazing uh, comment. He says, if a servant Tavis would fall out on Shabbos, we would still fast. Unlike Tisha B'av, which falls out on Shabbos, we, uh, our calendar is so set up that it can't fall out on Shabbos. A servant Tavis can. But theoretically, says the Beis Yosef, that if a servant Tavis would fall out on Shabbat, it would not be pushed off like Tisha B'av, but we would continue to fast on Shabbos just like we fast on Shabbos Wat Yom Kippur. The question is why? Why? And the Beis Yosef quotes the Avud Ra'am, he says it's amazing. It says in this Postle in Yecheskel Chavdalit by today's fast, Etzem Ayom Azeh, and the same words are used in Pashis Emor by Yom Kippur, it also says what? Etzem Ayom Azeh. So it's incredible. The Avud Ra'am is making a hekesh between what today and Yom Kippur. What's the connection between Etzem Yom Azeh today, Yecheskel Perich of Dalit, and Etzem Yom Azeh, those words are used by Yom Kippur and Parsha Zemor? What can be connected, what could be the connection between what? Elisheva, between what? Today and Yom Kippur. And why is today such a severe fast? No Jews were killed. The siege began. Samach Melech Boba Yerushalayim. So what's the mystical link between uh, the tenth day of Tavis and the tenth day of what? Tishrei. Ten, ten, right? So the Vilna Gong gives us an idea. 
The Vilna Gaon tells us that there are 12 months in the year, Beryl, and there are 12 tribes. The Vilna Gaon says that each month represents a Shevet. Which month does this Shevet? Tavis is which month? I know, but which uh, tribe? Dun. The Vilna Gaon says that each month represents a tribe of Israel. Today's month represents Shevet Dan. What does Dan mean? Judgment. What is Yom Kippur all about, Michael? You see, incredible. The 10th day of Tavis, the 10th day of Tishrei, both say Etzem Ayom Azeh. And the Vilna Gaon helps us out. He says because uh, the month of Tavis corresponds to Shevet Dan. Dan, Yom Hadin. Isn't Yom Kippur Shevet Yom Hadin? Get it? Now why? Why is the month of Tavis such a judgmental day? So the Vilna Gaon points out that the month of Tavis is a tragic month for us. Besides Samach Melech Babel, the month of Tavis is when Ezra HaSofer died. In fact, yesterday was his yardside, Avi. The Talmud in Sanhedrin 23 says if God would not have given the Torah to Holy Moses, his second choice would be who? Ezra. So Ezra is number two on the all-time hit parade. And he died yesterday. So the month of Tavis is a tragic day because Ezra Sulfur died. The Bill Gohan also points out that J.C. Penny was born this month. J.C. Penny was born this month. In fact, New Year's is his bris. They, the Goyim don't know why they're getting drunk on New Year's. It's the bris of J.C. Penny. Roseanne, you didn't know that. Well, you didn't know it, okay? So how much tourists did J.C. Penny bring on Am Yisrael? How much tar? That's what LA pizza is. Right? It's the so it's a tra tragic the month. Pizza, uh, hey, this. The and the Talmud says another tragedy happened that this month the Greek ruler Ptomale, Ptomale, he forced the Yidden to translate the Torah into Greek. That took place on the month of Tavis. So it's a tragic, judgmental month for us. So what's so tragic, Dr. Abramson, about translating the Torah to Greek? Art scroll before art scroll. Why did Chazal say it's a tragic day like building the Golden Getschke? Madua Balama. So the translation, but before that, because when the, the Torah was translated to Greek, why is it a day like Cheta Egel? Because it led to Hellenism. It put a kosher stempel. Now, if the Torah is in Greek, then we can follow the Greeks. It's Greek to me. It put a kosher stamp on Hellenism. Now the Torah is in Greek, so therefore, it's a Greek culture is also the Seder. And that was a downward spiral of Hellenism. Right? But the Jews assimilated. If the Torah is in Greek, then Greek culture is also the Seder. Oh, Hanoch, you must have ESP, right? So the Talmud of Megillah points out that uh, the Greek king put 70 rabbis in 70 different rooms to translate that. They all came out with the same, the same translation. There were changes there, like the, the, let us make man, right? So it looks like there's more. One has to so it said, I will make man. So 70 rabbis in 70 different in rooms. And the nest was that they all came out with the same interpretation. A bigger nest would have been, you would have put 70 rabbis in one room, and they all came out with the same interpretation. That is so Connie, that would have been a bigger nest. You put 70 rabbis in 70 different rooms, and they all came out, same translation, nest. But a bigger nest, Diesel, not 70 different rooms, put all rabbis in one room, and they all agreed to one translation. Avi, I think that's even a bigger Ness. Yeah. Okay. That's why he didn't try that. That's <laughs> Ness Betoch Ness. Let's not go there, right? But anyway, uh, Torah is in Greek. Now Greek culture is Beseder. And that's led to the downward spiral of Hellenism. Now, today we read the after effects of the Chet Egel. I'm going to read it again by Mincha. We read it in the morning. Where Hashem gives us the second tablets as a sign of what? That he still loves us. 
Despite we committed adultery on the honeymoon, right? We said Nasim and Ishma, 40 days later, still the honeymoon, and we committed spiritual adultery. So the second tablets are called Eidut. Why are they called Eidut? Not the first. The second are called Eidut, Moshe. So Rashi brings Chazal. It's a testimony that what? I can't stop loving you. Even though you sinned with the Egel, I'm giving you a second set of tablets to demonstrate that I still love you. And therefore, only the second tablets are called Eidut. They testify that God continues to love us, to love us despite the, uh, the sin of the Egel. Now, Rasavetik has something amazing. He says, how come the first tablets didn't work out? And the second did. So Rasavetik says that the first tablets was all God. We had no input at all. I think they say, easy come, easy go. But the second tablets, he says, the first tablets, God supplied the tablets and the writing. Right? We had no input. The second tablets was a joint shittif pu'ula. How do you say that in English? Shittif pu'ula. How do you say that? Partnership. Where God supplied the writing and Moshe Rabbeinu supplied the tablets. So Ratzavetzik says, when we and God do it together, so happy together. The second tablets, buddy, were never destroyed. The second tablets are still here waiting to be revealed when Mashiach comes. So the Rav points out that when we and God do it together, shittif pu'ula, because all of life is a partnership between God and us, so therefore since the second tablets we were involved, wasn't just God, therefore they were never destroyed. And they are waiting to be revealed when, when the, the Mashiach comes. So this idea of Rasalvechik I want to apply Perhaps that's why the first two temples were destroyed. The first two temples was all made by man. God wasn't involved at all. Right? Right. Hmm? No. The first two temples were all man made. The third temple, the third temple, since it's going to be Shittif Pu'ula, and we'll see how and when, since it'll be a joint venture. Perhaps the third temple, like the second tablets, Michael, since God and us are involved, that's why they're going to last. That's why the third temple, unlike the first two, were destroyed. The first two was all one side. And the first tablet was all one side. The first tablet, all God. The first two temples, also one side, all us. Second tablet was a joint venture, they're still around. So I want to say perhaps that's why the third temple, unlike the first two, which will be a joint venture, like the second tablets, Michael, that's why the third temple, like the second tablets, will be what? Forever. And we'll see, and we'll see how. Okay? We'll see how this plays out. Now why is the temple so important? Why is the temple so important in Judaism? Why do we want a third temple? Huh? What's wrong without a temple? Well, Moshe, why is the temple so central to Judaism? Because if you look in the Sefer HaMitzvot, more than half of the Taryag Mitzvot depends entirely on what? On a Beis HaMikdash. You look at this, the, the Mitzvot count, you'll see that more than half barrel we can't do for the last 1947 years. We're spiritually crippled. That's why we want a Beis HaMikdash. Able to do the Tayyag Mitzvot. And that's why it's so central to... We don't want to be spiritually crippled. 1947 years, is, I think, is enough. Now, this is what the Raman says here in Hilchus Malachim. Now, if you turn the paper over, I actually have the diagram of the Third Temple. So when the Messiah comes, Hanoch, he can just look at this and know what to do. This is taken from the book of Yechezkel, chapter 40, by the way. In the book of Yechezkel, chapter 40, you have the diagram of the third Bet HaMikdash. Stay tuned. Now, the problem is, the Ramam says that Mashiach will reinstitute Karbonot. But in Marion of Uchim, he says something else. He says, why did God tell us to bring Karbonot? 
He says because the Jewish people were addicted to bringing karbonot to what? The to avoid the Zara. So God said, instead of bringing karbonot to avoid the Zara, do it my way. So Ram and Mernavuche in Perik Lamed says the whole purpose of karbonot of karbonot is to wean the Jews off of avodah okay. zara. So why should we have? But in the way? third temple, who is still sacrificing to Getzkis? And yet the Rambam says that what? <coughs> that Mashiach will come and we will reinstitute the sacrificial system. And that the only reason is to wean us off of avodah zara. Who's still burning carbons to avodah zara today? Right? In the third temple. And yet the Ramam says that we're still going to have karbonot. So there seems to be a problem. But you have to understand, the Ramam was moire nevuchim. What does that mean? This guide to the perplexed. He's writing to people that are perplexed and looking for rational answers. That's not the only reason why we have karbonot. God only knows why. The word karban does not mean sacrifice, Avi. It comes from the word karov. Somehow you get close to God. We don't know how, but somehow you get close to God. The Rambam is writing for people that are perplexed and looking for rational answers. So he gives them a rational answer to wean us off of Avodah Zarah. But of course it's not the only reason. It's a reason. Therefore in the Hebrew, how do you say reason? Tom. What does Tom mean? It's a lick. It's only a taste. The real reason is because he said so. But in Murray Nebuchim, I'll give you a reason to pacify you. Because you're a real rational being. So the Ramam gives a reason to wean us off of Avodah Zarah. But of course that's only a reason. So in the third temple, we're going to have Karbono. Because it's what? God's reason. Okay. So, who builds the third temple? Do we build it or does, uh, does HaKadosh Baruch Hu build it? Okay. Now, before we end, a Jew answers Akasha, but not Akasha. Uh, the word Jerusalem, Michael, is mentioned 667 times in Tanakh. If you don't believe me, you can count, doctor. And never once in the Chumash. But the word Yerushalayim is mentioned in Tanakh 667. Roseanne, you don't believe me, you can count. What's so significant about 667? When did the IDF retake Yerushalayim? When? 667. Now, of course it's Lazi. But there are no Kawinki Dinkies, Doctor, that the IDF retook the Holy City of Jerusalem in June 667. Roseanne, Kawinki Dinky? That Yerushalayim is mentioned 667 in Tanakh. This is unbelievable. So what if it's Lazi? There are no Kowinki Dinkies, Mickey. Six six seven. Avram Avinu was born in nineteen forty eight, a Jewish state in forty eight. The first Jew, the first mitzvah, make Aliyah. Abraham was born in the year forty eight, a Jewish state. Forty eight. Kowinki Dinky? I don't think so. What's amazing, even though it's mentioned Chanok six six seven in Tanakh, June six sixty seven. Harabai is the Yedenu, Halavai. But it's not mentioned once in the Chumash. Oh. Ephraim. It's not mentioned once in the Chumash. Why? What? So what? Not mentioned once. So the Rambam Marin Vuchin gives a reason. He says if it mentioned it in the Chumash, then the Canaanites would totally destroy it. There would be nothing left of it. So God's engaged in a cover up. And he also says the Shvatim would fight over it, so he had to wait till Amelech. The first time Yishalayim is mentioned is in Sefer Yeshua. Yeshua had to deal like Amelech. So the Jews shouldn't bicker. Each tribe will say, I want it, I want it. So God covers up. But I have an opinion, Rabbi Yaakov, why Yishalayim is not mentioned in Chumash, my opinion. The closest is Malki Tzedek Melech Sholem. In Pasha's Lechlacha says, Unkelus Melech Sholem, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, right? Yerushalayim, right? Yore Shalem. Yore Harashem Yeroe Shalem, right? The mountain where God sees, the mountain of peace, and God combined the names of Abraham and Malki Tzedek. Yore Shalem. Malki Tzedek called the city Shalem. 
And Abram called it Hashem Yireh. Yireh Shalem. Who, who came first? Buddy. Malki Tzedek came first. So the city should be called Sholem Yireh. Toysus in, in Tainus Daftezayim says God combined the names of these two great people. Malki Tzedek called the city Sholem. Uh, Abraham called it Yireh. But Malki Tzedek named it first. So the city should be called Sholem Yireh. Yireh Sephraim. Why is it Yireh Sholem? Because you can't have peace unless you have Yireh Hashem. Yireh means, it means to see, but also means to fear. You can't have Sholem. There'll never be Sholem unless you have fear of God first. So Yireh comes before the Sholem. But anyway, you know why the name of Yishalayim is not mentioned in Chumash according to my opinion? Because if you look in Ezekiel chapter 40, chapter 48, the name of the city will change. Right. It'll be called Hashem, Hashem Shama. Right. Hashem Shama. Hashem is over there. So the post office will have to change all the uh, zip codes. You have to change your envelopes. <laughs> the city will not be called Yerushalayim, Ezekiel 48. Hashem Shama. Hashem is over there. Or Baba Basra has another reading, Hashem Shema. Hashem is her name. There are no dots in the Torah in the Tanakh. You could read Hashem Shema, God is there, or Hashem Shema, God is her name. But anyway, Beryl, the name will change to protect the innocent. Remember that? Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, perhaps that's why Yushalayim is not mentioned in the Chumash, because it's not gonna it's not gonna be called El Quds. But it won't be called Yerushalayim. It'll be called Hashem Shama. God is over there to symbolize that God's uh, presence is there all the time. Okay, now. In the uh, describing the Bet HaMikdash, in the Book of Kings, God describes, uh, the, the Novi in the Book of Kings repeats Solomon's temple five times and the Mishkan is also repeated five times. Hmm? Why is it so important to repeat the account of the temple five times? And we know there's exactly 304,000 Aaron five letters in a Torah scroll. Michael, you don't believe me, you can count. There isn't one extra letter. And here the account of the Beis Amigdash in the Book of Kings is repeated five times to prove that what? That the, uh, the climax of the goal of humanity is to have what? A Beit HaMikdash, not just for us. People make a mistake. What does God tell Isaiah? Ki Beiti Beiti Fila Yikore Lecholo Amin God says my house will be a house of prayer Lecholo Amin, he tells Isaiah. It's the climax, the goal of humanity is the Bet HaMikdash. It's not just a building, it's the concept where heaven and earth vav up, get it? Luz, the silent vav, where they interconnect, heaven and earth meet, like the luz in the back of the neck that connects the guf to the neshama, where the earth and the heaven link up. That's the temple, that's the climax, for the goyim too, yes? That's right. They, they can't bring anything else, they can That's right. But the point is that it's basi basi fila yikare lecholo amin for the EU as well, even for John Balkeri. Mm. Mm. Now, <clears throat> the first two temples were destroyed, but the last temple is going to stand forever. How do I know? Well, stay tuned. The last one is going to stand forever. Now, how do we know that the last one is going to stand forever? Unlike the first two, which were destroyed. Now, <clears throat> there's a puzzle in the book of Haggai, chapter 2. You can look it up. Haggai is building the second temple. And we know the second temple was a miskin. How do you say that in English? Pathetic compared to the first temple. 
Right? Didn't have Malchus based David, didn't have the Aaron, didn't have the Luchot, the Sheba and Mishka, no Malchus based David, no open Shechina. And yet God tells Chagai, Godel Yeh Habayit Hazeh Ha'acharon Min Arishon. Greater is this house that you're building than the first one. How could it be greater? It didn't have the five things that the first temple didn't have. How could it be greater? So the Talmud said it was greater because the first temple stood for 410 years, Beryl, and the second temple stood for what? 420. 420. So it stood for longer, so that's why it's greater. But the Zoya is not happy with that. That's why. So the Zoya, sometimes the Zoya is not mystical. You know, the Zoya is actually a perush on Tanakh. The Zoya says something incredible. First of all, to answer this question, we ask another. Why is the second temple called Acharon? What does Acharon mean? Last. But Reb Shmuel, the, last, the second temple is not last. So why does he call it Acharon? So the Zoya says, you got to put a hyphen. You know what a hyphen is? A dash. You hear this? The second temple could have been Achron, says the Zoya. It could have been Achron. Abayi Sazer could have been the Achron. Could have. Who says if is a stiff? You look in the book of Ezra. When the call came for the Jewish people to come back to Israel, only 42,000 Yidden came. Millions remained behind in Babylon, Long Island. And in Borough Park. Ezra Bushat, you look at the book of Ezra, the temple was standing. There wasn't even enough Kahanim and Levites to run the temple. Ezra had to go back to Babylon, Long Island, put an ad in the Jewish press. <laughs> Kahanim and Levites wanted to run the Beis HaMikdash. Ezra Busha Becherpa. You hear this? Right? That's why there's so few, Rasavetic said, that's why there's so few Levium. Around. There are not too many Levian. They didn't want to come back. So never they got lost. So Habayi Shazeh could have been the Achron. If the Yidin would have come back on the Ezra, Michael, the last temple would have been the Achron. But we have free will. So we can push off the Achron for almost 2,000 years. Only 42,000 came back. The Levian didn't want to come back. No, no Levian whatsoever. Very few. And that's why Mashiach didn't come after Nespurim. Why didn't Mashiach come after Nespurim? All the Jews became Haredi. Like they all became Haredi. So the, Chabad says, because the Rebbe wasn't born yet. No, like but, but why shouldn't Mashiach have come then? Because they remained in Babylon and Paras. They didn't leave. We can be Haredi in Babylon, Long Island too. So therefore Mashiach didn't come and therefore the second temple was destined to be destroyed but it didn't have to be this way. You see God has an end game. We have free will. We can push off the end game but we can't cancel it. Our free will can delay the end game by 2,000 years. We can delay it but we can't cancel it. By the year 6,000 I'll be the jig is up. You can pay me now, you can pay me later. But anyway, that's why Chagai says, God will abaya sazeh ha'acharon. It could have been acharon. If the Yidna would have come back, it would have been the last. The last was not to be, and therefore was destined to be destroyed. But how do we know that the third temple won't be destroyed? Right? How do I know? Now, what Ruvain mentioned before, Ruvain mentioned there seems to be a machloikis between the Rambam and Rashi and Tosfot. The Rambam on your source sheet says clearly that Melech look at the source sheets again where it's highlighted in the yellow. He says the Melech HaMashiach Otid Lamod Lelachsor Malchus David Ubonah HaMikdash So Rambam says clearly that the uh, third temple will be built by human hands by Melech HaMashiach. Ah, you'll get Chinese workers maybe Filipinos and they'll build the, the temple. But as Ruben pointed out, uh, Rashi in Sukkah 41 and Rosh Hashanah 30 and Tosvot, right, that the third temple 
will come down from heaven in a fiery like chariots of fire what the um, third close encounter of the third kind <laughs> so Rashi and Sukkah and Rosh Hashanah Tosas and Tractate Shavuot say that the third temple we made by fire and come down from heaven already built by God so according to Rashi and Tosot Ruvain, what do you need Yechezkel for? Why do I need this for? According to Rashi and Tosot, why did Yechezkel have to describe in painstaking detail, lovingly, all of the uh, ins and outs of the Third Temple, when according to Rashi and Tosot, Michael, it wouldn't matter, because it's going to come down from heaven. So why did God waste Yechezkel's time, Beryl? Look at this nice diagram. If it's up to God, then why bother us? Somebody's got to check the specification. Uh, what? Somebody's got to check the specification. It's very difficult. Rashi and Tosfot, very difficult. Do we wait to put on Tvilin for God? All the mitzvahs in the Torah depend on us. It's a mitzvah like putting on Tvilin. So we say, God will put on Tvilin for me. God will blow Shoifer for me. It's a mitzvah like putting on tefillin, also limigdash. So it's very difficult. Rashi and Tosfot will try to reconcile how they uh, how do they learn Yechezkel chapter 40. Right? And God tells them in loving detail how to build the third temple when it, according to them it doesn't matter because it will come down Moshe miraculously from, uh, from heaven, Reuben, right? So stay tuned. We'll try to... Uh, We'll try to, to, to iron out the, uh, the differences, okay? Anyway. <clears throat> the Medrash quotes Yechezkel, God, why are you telling me to build, to, to write this in such great detail? We know it's not going to happen for a long time. The Yidna are not coming back. It'll be thousands of years. Why bother? They're not coming back. The third temple, this could have been the second temple. If the Yidin would have come back. But Yechezkel told God they're not coming back. They're too attached to Borough Park in Babylon, Long Island. They have, you know, coils there. and They got everything there, right? So they're not coming back. So we're not going to have this for centuries. Why bother to write it and to teach them? So the Medrash quotes, God answered Yechezkel. Is it right that because my children are in exile that they should not study about the building of the base on Migdash. Study about it. Study about it. It's a Medish uh, Tanchuma at the end of Ayakel. God says, let them study about the temple and I will give them reward, ki'ilu, as if they occupy themselves in building it. That's called build it and he will come, right? So if we study about it and if we show God that we really want it, not just paying lip service to it, then perhaps we're going to get it sooner later, uh, than later. Because we don't want to run out the clock to the year 6,000. We're getting close. We're in 5776, buddy. You take your vitamins, you take your spirulina, we'll make it. The end game, right? But the year 6,000 is not that far off, right? People are living longer now. They're saying that uh, um, 60, 80 is the new 60. Mickey, right? No. That's what they're no. saying. 80 is the new 60. I yeah, yeah. Much better at 60. Can I know her? You look 50, though. Can I know her? 9.30 is the new midnight. 9.30 is the new midnight, right? <laughs> right, okay. Mm -hmm. So, according to, uh, according to a Rashi and Tosfot, the building of the temple won't concern us. It won't be built by human hands. So, uh, that's very difficult. Again, why give us the diagram? Who cares? It's going to come down from heaven. And it's one of the Tayyad Mitzvot. You look in the Sefer Achinuch and the Rambam, V'osili Migdash V'shechanti B'tocham is in the same Tayyad Mitzvot, Michael, like putting on tefillin. You're going to wait for God to put on tefillin for you? You're going to wait for God to blow shoifer for you? So what does Rashi and Tosas mean? We're going to wait for God to build the Migdash. We don't find Chanoch any other mitzvah that we wait for God to do. We're supposed to do the mitzvot, not God. So how, how do we reconcile this? So we said earlier, Elisheva, if you were listening, shittif pu'ula. 
How do you say that in English, Roseanne? What? Partnership. Partnership, joint venture. So happy together. It'll be a joint venture. And I know that if you look at the, Mus the Yontiv Musav Amida, not Yontiv, but Musav Yontiv, we pray, Grant that we may see the Beis Amigdash in its rebuilding, and rejoice at its Tikuno. What does Tikun mean, Yehuda? Fix. So if it's built, why do you have to fix it for? If it ain't broke, Avi, don't fix it. So what are we saying in the Musaf davening? Yomtev. Let me see its rebuilding. And let me rejoice in its fixing. So what does that mean, Elisheva? Maybe the building would refer to the building descending from heaven and the repair jobs would be done by us. Perhaps. Hmm? Bivinyono, God will build it. Bitikuno, we will perfect it. Again, joint venture. What's the role model, Mickey? The second tablets. Joint venture. Moses supplied the tablets and God supplied the writing. So you see the parallel? God will supply the building and will supply the furniture. So the Mochan Hamigdash, Roseanne, the Mochan Hamigdash, they have the furniture. Joint venture, Elisheva, that's your, you'll be the interior designer. Elisheva, we can consult you, she's an interior designer. Anybody needs, huh? needs a good interior designer. Go to Elisheva, right? I said also like, that's right. Also, also like the bris. God provides the body, and we provide the finish. Oh, well, when I go, when I get there, what? It must be do a lot of catering there. They got four kitchens. The four kitchens. Uh, see that? Four kitchens. Well, you know, no. Jews <laughs> love to eat. You know, we have a young tip. They try to kill us. We won. Let's eat. That's why all Jewish holidays are manja manja. Four kitchens. What does tikkun mean? Tell me, Ruvain. You know Hebrew. Tikkun. The samcheni b'tikkuno. God will do the binyan. Vanachdu, we will rejoice in the tikkun. Tikkun olam by repairing the temple, by building the furniture, by being God's partner in a joint venture like the second tablets. That's why they were never destroyed. See, the first two temples, like the first tablet, was all one-sided. It can't last. But the second tablets, God and us, and the third temple, like the second tablet. God will do the binyan, will do the tikkuno. Make sure there's no Arab workers. No, just Filipinos, right? Mm -hmm. So that's pretty amazing. This universe over there, there. Buddy, Musaf Yomtev, Avienu Bibinyono, God will bring the binyan. Visamchenu, and we will rejoice b'tikuno. The word tikkun olam, repairing the temple, fixing the temple, perfecting the temple, where heaven and earth will once again, Moshe Wat, meet the luz. The luz, it's incredible that Ramor Chalayo, Zechet Sadik Levracha, wrote a pikabala that the Harabayis gives koach to all those who possess it. He says, Israel's enemies draw their ability to attack us from their control of Harabayat. Ramon Chalayo, in one of his Parsha sheets, before he passed away, the Kolalayo, he wrote that Al Pikabala Harabayat gives koach to those who possess it. He says, Our enemies draw their ability to attack us from their control of Harabayat. Right? It gives Islam, he says, a spiritual wellspring to fight us. Because they know it's the laws of the universe. Halavai, we would, why did they go ballistic when a Jew goes on Harabayas and we start uh -oh. moving our lips? Why did they go ballistic for? Why should they care if we mumble a prayer? Ephraim, say a little prayer for me. Why should they care when we pray the waf goes crazy? Because they believe in the power of Jewish prayer. 
They know if enough Yidin pray for the temple and do Ishtadlut, it's going to happen. So they have a right to be terrified. Halavai, we would believe the way our peace partners believe, Leah. So why, yeah, why did the, the, the chief rabbi say don't go up? Because, Miki, if you go up there without going to a mikvah, to go it's to like mikvah. you eat on Yom Kippur. But how many people go to the mikvah and clean and cut their nails and untangle their hair? Because even if you go to a mikvah without first properly cleaning yourself, it's like you didn't go to the mikvah. It's, you still have chatzitza, and it's like eating on Yom Kippur. So the rabbi was afraid that many people, they say they go, and they don't go, and even if they do go, they don't make the proper preparation to get rid of the makeup, and the nail polish, and the dirt on the fingernails, and to untangle the hair, otherwise the, the mikvah abi is meaningless. So going on the Temple Mount without a proper immersion on the mikvah is like eating on Yom Kippur, lo yaleinu. It's chayef karet. But we had the power, and we could have stopped everyone from going up, including the Arabs. Instead, we, we just restricted the Jews. Right. But the rabbis had a, have, a, have, a, a, have a rational fear that many people will not do a proper immersion. I know. Right? Well, and that's well, like eating onion kipper. Well, but if you do properly go to the mikvah, of course you go up well, there. But you have to first go to the mikvah and first make a proper cleansing. Hello, hello. And you need a, a supervisor to make sure that not even one hair is sticking out from the mikvah. You need a supervisor to watch to watch you. I remember listening to the tape. Yeah. When Kahada said in the Knesset, he said, okay, but above him say, don't go on Harabai, right? Right. He says, you know what? I'll, let's compromise. Okay, you, you don't want Jews to go on Harabai? Don't let the Arabs no. either. Don't, don't let the Arabs either. I said, uh -huh. okay, I'll compromise. Why don't you go on that's right. You're right. But anyway, how do we get back? Who builds a third temple? Is Rashi right? Is the Rambam right? They're both right, Beryl. Elu be Elu, Dibalim Chayim. How could they both be right? They're also right. You know how they're right? Like Yehuda Lev mentioned before. The Gemara in Gnida Kedushin tells us there are three partners in a human being. Gibel Shutfin Ba Adam, Gemara Nida and Kedushin, there are three partners in a human being. God supplies the soul, and the parents supply the body. That's what it's all about. This entire setup is a partnership between God and us. And you see the birth of a child, buddy. The birth of a child. Can God do it alone? God can only supply the soul. We have to supply what? The body. the body. So each human being actually has three parents. Did you know that? Three is a crowd. The heavenly parent who supplies the soul and the earthly parent who supply the body. And that's the dogma. How do you say dogma in Hebrew? Yeah. Um, in English. That's the dogma for the third temple. The third temple. We supply the building or God supplies the building and we supply what? The furniture. Yeah. A joint venture, right? Yeah. So anyway, we have a, uh, both opinions, Rashi and Tosfot, on one hand, who says the third temple will descend from heaven, and the Rambam, on the other hand, who says that the third temple will be built by human hands, by Mashiach. They're both right, because the answer is Shittif Pu'ula. Nikki, I like that word. Two words. Shittif Pu'ula. Joint venture. And that's how we reconcile two seeming conflicting texts. In Pashas B'Shalach it says, Migdash Hashem Koinini Yodecha. The temple of God your hands will establish. In Pashas B'Shalach says that God builds the third temple. Pashas B'Shalach, buddy. Migdash Hashem Koinini Yodecha. The Migdash of Hashem God your hands will do it. In Pashas Truma it says, V'osali Migdash. You shall build for me a Migdash. So the texts seem to conflict, Abraham. Do they conflict? Rabbi Abraham. No, they don't conflict. Huh? Joint venture. God and us together. Migdash Hashem Koinini Yedecha. That's the uh, building. Ba'osoli Migdash. That's the furniture. Temple Institute. They got the furniture. Yeah. Right? So God, we doing our part. You have to do yours. 
Wow. Partners. He has those versions like a draft of an engineer. Right. So that's our part. That's our part? So, you saw, so you in other words, this is like the idea. Right. But the physicality can come from <clears throat> We just yeah. saw the movie about how what we had to do to make the land of Israel come by itself. We waited for God. Now, to it wouldn't have happened. We fought for it. We fought for it. Zechariah calls us. Zechariah says that we are Asire Hatikva. We are prisoners of hope. Zechariah. Hatikva. Three years after Hitler, a third of our people were annihilated. We rise from the ashes of Auschwitz to build this wonderful country. The envy of the whole world, a leader in high tech, medicine, startup, you name it. How is that possible? Three years after Hitler, we didn't throw in the towel. My father in law lost a wife and seven children, and he started over again to build a new family. How is that possible? Because Zechariah 2,500 years ago says we are Asire Hatikva. What does that mean? Prisoners of hope. We never give up hope. Despite the tzarot, despite the din, this month is done din. And therefore Yaakovinu by Shevet Dun says in this week's Pasha, Lishya Oscha Kivisi Hashem. Despite the din, the tzorot, we trust in you, God. We never give up hope. We are prisoners of hope. Zechariah chapter 9. But anyway, another complicated issue, we're getting uh, down to Mincha almost, whether the mitzvah to build the temple or the furniture is binding on us even before Mashiach comes, or do we have to wait for Mashiach? The Rambam says, Melech HaMashiach Bona HaMikdash. So the Rambam says that the Temple Institute jumped the gun. Right? Mashiach, we have to wait for Mashiach to build it. In fact, the Rambam says, what's the major proof that he's Mashiach? Besides getting the Jews out of Borah Park, he is he builds it. the Temple. That's proof that he's Mashiach. Right? But the Sefer HaChinuch disagrees with the Rambam. Normally he says, Derech HaMelech Melech. But here he disagrees with his great uh, illustrious Rebbe. In Pasha's Truma, he says, V'osoli Migdash, he says, V'noheget mitzvizu bizman sherov Yisrael al Admatan. The mitzvah to build the temple, unlike Rambam, doesn't depend on Mashiach. When the majority of the Jewish people live in Israel, then the mitzvah to build the temple, Chanoch, kicks in. It doesn't depend on Mashiach like Rambam says. Here it is, Michael. So according to Sefer Achinoch and Pashis Truma, the mitzvah of Osali Migdash built for me a temple, Bisman Sharov Yisrael Alad Matan, when the majority of Jewish people live here. As soon as the majority of Jewish people live in Israel, not yet, not yet, we're getting close, then the obligation to build the Migdash. So according to Sefer Achinoch, the mitzvah is not dependent on Mashiach like Rambam. It's an obligation on the tzibur when the majority of world Jewry lives in Israel. According to Jerusalem Post, that will be in the year 2030. According to the, the Jerusalem Post, that will be in the year 2030. By the year 2030, the majority of Jewish people will live in Israel. And then it will be an obligation on us to what? Build the temple. How many Jews are there in the world? 13 million. So how many Yidin are there here now? No, there's 6 million. Almost 6. No, Yidin, Yidin. Yeah, but how many real Yidin, right? So who's right, Rambam or the Chinuch? The Chinuch lived in 1200, after the Rambam. He normally says, Derech HaMelech Melech. He calls the Rambam the Melech. What does Derech HaMelech mean? King's Highway. King's Highway. Not in Brooklyn. But here he begs to differ with his great Rebbe. He says it doesn't depend on what, the Chama, on the Messiah, when the majority of the world, Yidin, live here, there's a mitzvah to build a temple. Is that, is that a Gemara? Where does he get it from? Where does the Chinuch get it from? I don't know. Look in Pasha's Truma. Also, we Migdash, he says. So is it up to Mashiach or is it up to us? So we know, Eilu be Eilu, Divrel Him Chaim. The Rambam is right. 
it depends on Mashiach, Roseanne, and also the Chinook was right, it depends on us. Because when the majority of the world's Yidden live in Israel, then Mashiach has to come. Don't you see? Chanoch. Oh, yeah. The Rambam and the Chinook don't argue. The Rambam says it depends on Mashiach. The Chinook says it depends on the majority of world Yidden living here. But, I want to say there's no machloikis, because when the majority of the Yidden live here, Mashiach has to come. So every Yid that makes Aliyah, Roseanne, is speeding up the Messianic era. And every Yid that doesn't make an Aliyah, Nabek is holding the Mashiach back. I don't say that. The Vilna Gaon said that. The Vilna Gaon told this Tamidim to make Aliyah before Herzl. The Vilna Gaon. He says, Mashiach can't come, says Vilna Gaon, until the majority of the world Yidden live where? Here. here. And therefore, Tamidim came here in the 1700s with no El Al. That's no El Al in the 1700s. And he tried, he tried to come. He was shipwrecked by pirates. So Rav Cook got it from Rav Cook's study. What he had to say. Rav Cook got it from the Vilna Gaon. So every yid that makes Aliyah is speeding up Mashiach, and every yid that doesn't make Aliyah Nebuch, he doesn't realize he's holding up the Messiah. Yes. <laughs> what? I believe with perfect faith that when Mashiach comes, there will be very few or zero differences of opinion because he will get by with help from his friend Eliyahu Navi. Aliyah Hanavi, a little help from my friends, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> so once the majority of the Yidden live here, the Bill of God already said Mashiach has to come. So how come the Yidden don't uh, invite all of them, the Yidden, all of our relatives, our friends, to say, hey, it's time. Why do you want to run no. out the clock, Mickey? No. Why do you want to run out the clock to the year 6,000? Oh, it's too long oh. and too the long and winding road. Too long, it's too cool. long way home. You got the whole world in your head. The destiny's up to us. If they didn't come here, Mashiach has to come. Says Vilna Gaon before Herzl. Elishama. Hmm. But some people say, "Don't confuse me with the facts." Ephraim. Some people say, don't confuse me with the facts. I'm waiting for Mashiach. The Vilna Gaon says, well, Mashiach is waiting for you. He can't come unless you make Aliyah first. They don't realize that. A friend of mine is teaching computer, and all of a sudden now she has to learn French, because the French are coming in. The French are coming, yeah. Baruch Hashem, yes. right? Yes. Right? The British are coming. The French. Yeah. The British <laughs> that's that's God's game plan. You have yeah. a John Balkari. You have an abomination. That's God's game plan to oh, get yeah. the Yidden from Borough Park to make Aliyah. Yeah. Who's going to certify that they're kosher Jews? Well, that's the problem within the Jewish. That's community. not up to us, Roseanne. Right? It's not up to us. <laughs> well, it's not up to the right? It's not up to us. Right? Majority of the world, Yidin come. Mashiach is not going to come That's to right. say who's kosher or not, right? What does the Mishnah say? Mashiach will come, la yeah. shalom. Right? La shalom. Peace. Yeah. To Mishra. make peace, right? right. But Shalom's real peace, there. not peace process, right? Mm -hmm. So we're getting there slowly. Therefore, Mashiach is called Tzemach. One of the names of Mashiach, Yehud, is Tzemach. What does Tzemach mean? A plant. It grows gradually. We're getting there, yiddle by yiddle. Like the, Rabbi Abramson, like yiddle by yiddle. Like Literally, every yiddle that comes is bringing the Messiah one step closer. And we see it in front of our eyes. It's happening. Right? Baruch Hashem, we're here. But our fellow yiddin still have to come. Let them come before they run out of apartment room. No, what? No, you have to lift the building freeze, BB. You have to lift off the building freeze, right? Because uh, we need to get ready, right? Take the Arabs' apartments. It's right? Of apartments but sooner or later, the Yidin, today is uh, uh, the, uh, the Rabbunat established. Today is Kaddish Kalali for all those people that died in the Holocaust, and we don't know their yacht site. And we don't know if they have any people to say Kali for them. So the Rabbanut says that today, Asar Vatavis, when the Tsaurus began, right, the siege begins. It ended with Tishabav. Right. But the Tsaurus began today. So 
add them to your Kaddish. So therefore, I'm going to say Kaddish now, the Rabbanan will have in mind the, the six million Kaddishim, okay? And we're going to dive in Mincha at, at four o'clock, okay? Any questions, comments? Any questions, comments? I have a question. Like a shah, On the misinterpretations of the Torah, what were they? Uh, where it says, God says, let us make man. You're not going to write that, because J.C. Penny will get the idea, Trinity. So they said, I will make man. They changed in other places too, so the, the heretics shouldn't have a chance to say, there's more than what? Right, in the beginning God created... Uh, how do you know God is a baseball fan? In the big inning. Yeah. In the big inning, God created, God created the beginning. Right? So they made subtle changes, each one in a separate room. And there's a miracle, it would have been a bit of a miracle, put them all in the same room, if they'd agree. But that miracle, you know, forget about that.